Okay, so really in about maybe 20 minutes, I just kind of want to go through um, the, the main essential ideas of how uh, when we start looking at not just like uh, velocities in relativistic terms, you know, we measured in frame S or S prime, but if you start looking at changes in velocities, that's by, by definition acceleration. And so I'm not going to do a lot of deriving here, um, just partly because you can, you can spend the time going through a textbook or whatnot, and it's not necessarily all that elucidating for this. Um, I think it's more important to know how to kind of use the results of this, and I, I can speak in future lectures about how, how some of those results, how we get them and why they're important. But um, turns out that when we start talking about this idea of velocities changing, um, as you know, for example, when you're getting near the speed of light, you know, so if we imagine a velocity axis going from zero to infinity, there is a boundary here, x, boundary c, and as we get nearer and nearer that speed of light, clearly, as we keep trying to accelerate faster and faster, you can never quite, you know, like the more, the more you effort you put, you put into it, the less and less of a return you get, basically. Because you know that you can never actually reach the speed of light. And we'll see exactly why that results mathematically here on this, uh, on, in a physical setting. And, and so I think that's kind of interesting. It's, it's why the speed of light is truly a physical barrier, not just a mathematical, uh, uh, you know, mathematical artifact. Um, so the idea, though, is that if you want to keep on pushing on the gas and you keep accelerating more and more, your response or the change in velocity becomes less and less. Um, you know, so let's say you go from in 10 minutes or whatever, you accelerate from zero to 90 percent the speed of light. The next 10 minutes, you accelerate to 99 percent the speed of light. 10 minutes later, you accelerate to 99.9% the speed of light. So every time we get a factor of 10 closer, does, um, how, does that, how does the energy required to keep getting that closer, that much more and more closer, compare? Do we just need to apply you know, less and less energy as we get closer and closer, or what happens there? And specifically, as we get nearer and nearer the speed of light, how does our momentum uh, increase? Because clearly our velocity kind of reaches a limit. So does our momentum also reach a limit? And that's really kind of the, the starting point here. So let's start with momentum. And um, again, without really fully deriving this, I think it's, it, it's most helpful to make a chart of velocity versus momentum P. And by the way, um, I'm going to imagine there's velocity only in the x direction, however it works, if there's any arbitrary velocity in the y and the z as well. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll call it, actually I want to call it u. So I don't want to think of the, the uh, velocity of the reference frame, I want to think of a velocity of a particle as measured in the, the unprimed reference frame. So to be clear, that's how fast a particle is going, and this is that particle's momentum, both measured in frame s. And I'm just going to make a, a, a dash here. So here is C. And now for classical results, pretty clearly, shoot, where's my pens? Uh, pretty clearly, according to Newton, he just said that the momentum is equal to mv, or mu in this case here. So now I think we have a pretty good, pretty good indication that's not going to be what happens here. Um, so, as it turns out, if you two experimentally, you know, try this, or we don't really, like, get in a, a ship and, like, accelerate, but what we do is, specifically using um, experimental uh, particle detectors, if you can identify a certain particle of a, of a given mass, you see there's a, a proton that was released in an uh, interaction, it collides with a neutron here. We know exactly how much mass that proton has to about five sig figs. And you can measure its velocity in, you know, in, in these particle detectors, or you measure its energy, find its velocity from that. And what we can do is we can identify how much momentum was transferred at a given velocity. So that, that's specifically what I mean here. What is the amount of momentum that it has to give up in a collision? And specifically when we talk about collisions of particles, that's exactly what um, particle physicists are. That's like they're the thing they get off on. They look at particles colliding and they see what happens. So... Um, what we find experimentally is it goes like this. It goes up, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll use the same graph here. It starts off like Newton said, but then, as probably to be expected, it starts diverging, and turns out that as we get faster, the actual momentum 
becomes significantly greater than Newton, well, what Newton would have said at that uh, speed. Now we're talking here, you know, 75, 80, 90 percent the speed of light, and then it ends up reaching this type of behavior here, where pretty clearly you know where that's supposed to happen. So it does seem to reach an asymptotic value. People zero, people C. So it's some function that starts off in a linear fashion with, with uh, the velocity u, and it increases up like that. And as it turns out, that exact function here is going to be p equals the whatever the mass of that particle was. So again, we're, we're assuming that we have a particle of a known mass here times u times, believe it or not, that gamma factor for what for the velocity u there specifically in this case. So specifically, we're, we're treating that particle in that in that particle's frame of reference, how fast would they say that they're going relative to us? And now let's be a little bit careful here. Let's say this is m0, and this was the mass that we measured at rest. And then if it's not entirely clear, the way that I'm writing this here is 1 over u squared over c squared. So, you know, not really surprising at all, because we've seen this gamma factor over and over, and again, it starts at 1. So for this of 0, this whole gamma becomes 1, and it does start off very close to momentum equals m times whatever the velocity is, mv essentially, you know, mu. But as that gamma increases, it multiplies or it, it pulls that line up by a unbound factor once we get to C. So one of the results of this, is, so this is the first result, by the way, um, the relativistic momentum, we get P equals gamma M not U. And by the way, that will be a three-dimensional variable there. So we'll talk about the momentum four vector momentarily, but this is true in the x and in the y and the z direction. And the one thing you, you do need to you know, correct in that is that this would be the entire speed squared there. So you might have some zero component in, you know, in, in the y direction, but you may not have a zero component in the z direction. So the x, y, and z momentum would all transform according to that, but the gamma factor would relate to the total velocity. And so this also brings up an interesting point. We can talk about the relativistic mass. And if we compare this equation here, the, the relativistic momentum, to a normal momentum equation, the only difference is the mass that we normally write as m just turns into gamma m0. And so it's simple enough to write m equals gamma m0. So this essentially takes the place of the mass that, that we would otherwise use for equations. Now, if we think about this uh, uh, for a moment longer, this begins to help us get an idea of why it's going to become more and more difficult to actually reach the speed of light. So um, in this case here, if, if we think about the mass as kind of a, a quantity that depends on our speed, and that speed as we get closer and closer to speed of light, you know, if you go, you know, 10% closer, 10% closer, that factor of gamma begins to increase by a you know, unbound amount, so small changes in V still result in huge changes in, in mass at those high velocities, or change in, change in gamma, I should say. And so the, 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 basic, the basic physical kind of interpretation here is that as we get closer to the speed of light, the effective mass that, that it seems like we need to accelerate to get faster. So the, the idea is, let, let's say you want to play a game of actually accelerating the speed of light. The closer and closer you get to that value of, of uh, C, you're going to end up having effectively 
a heavier and heavier particle to push further. So that single neutron might start, uh, you know, seeming to weigh as much as a baseball. And as you push it faster, that bait, that, that, that they'll start weighing more like an automobile. As you get it 90% close to speed of light, that automobile will start weighing as much as a, as a meteor, a meteoroid. And yeah, as you push it further, that, that particle end up having the, the same effect of mass as a planet. And you can imagine it's really difficult to push that planet much faster than it's already going. So basically we hit a fundamental limit. The faster we push it, the more mass it gains. And the way Newton would say it has more inertia or more resistance to change further changes in motion. So I think that's a, a really uh, interesting physical insight here. Okay, so um, with that said, uh, a couple more quantities here. Now, I am going to write this out, and I'm not going to prove this at all at this point, so I think this will probably be the topic for the next class. But let's talk about the relativistic energy. And one thing that's, that, that, that I think is interesting here is, let's consider just a strictly dimensional analysis first. So we know that the units of energy, if we use the model of like kinetic energy, one half mv squared, or if you use like potential energy, uh, mgh, we know the units have to be some units of mass times like mv squared times a velocity squared. So we can think about the possible ways to, to construct that. Now, by the way, this relativistic mass, gamma will never have any units. So, so m naught just has units of whatever we're using, grams, kilograms, um, electron volts, kill electron volts, um, and, and you'll see how those work in the end. But, so that mass that we put in there, now we have a pretty good guess that mass should be just m. This, this M right there, the relativistic mass to be clear. Now, what velocity do we, want, do we want to put in here? And the reason we need to be a little bit careful, if we, if we choose to say the E, the, the, the overall relativistic energy here, um, by the way, I, sh I should be careful the way I'm writing this too, um, the energy has units of mass times units of velocity. I didn't mean to say it's, M it's equal to mv squared. So kilograms times meters squared per second squared is what I mean. Okay, so let's look back here at, at our equation for energy. Now, if, if I wanted to try to construct it as something like, you know, one half mv squared. In other words, if, if, I, if I guess that it's gonna be, you know, a half times the relativistic mass, and if you want, you call it REL, whatever, just, just to be entirely clear, it's that, times the current velocity of the particle, let's say u squared, whatever that is there. What we're led to is the idea that if gamma is zero, so at rest, I'm sorry, if gamma is one at rest, our velocity is zero, so we have no energy. But turns out that's not a quantity that every observer would agree on. Do you see why that's true? At rest in one frame, if that observer near the particle says there's zero energy, Another observer wishing by is going to say, no, you're an idiot. Clearly, that particle is moving with a, a, a fast velocity. Clearly, it has energy if you plug it into there. So do you see why this is a rather poor choice of, of, of formula here? Because it's frame dependent. That's only going to be true in the frame that you're measuring from. So here's a question. Is there any other velocity that we can throw in there that might be a more universally agreed on thing? Yeah, sure. Just throw in C. And let's get rid of that. That's the relativistic energy. So, so that's partly just a dimensional analysis. Now, can we put a factor of, of, you know, anything in front? Sure. And let's put the factor of gamma there. <laughs> And let's put m naught there. So, I mean, that's, that's exactly what we were talking about there before. We don't need any other factor of a half. And it, so it just looks a lot cleaner like that, with that understood to be the relativistic mass. And let me be entirely clear, that's what that is. So, based strictly on dimensional analysis, this is our guess for what it has to be. And we can play that game again now. So, so you can be a bit, you know, 
annoying and say, okay, well, in different frames, that relativistic mass will be perceived to be different. So now we now have a case where observers won't necessarily say that you have zero and non-zero. And that's important because you can you can never transform zero into something else. So two observers at some relative reference frames will say it has maybe a little more or less velocity based on how big that gamma factor is, but neither will say it's zero. But we still have a bit of a disparity. Observers will naturally disagree on what that energy is based on their relative um, speeds. And the way we rectify that is, well, we'll see here. So basically what, what, I, what I'm just referring to here is the fact that two observers aren't necessarily going to agree on this energy here. And that, that is still fairly reasonable physically, that one observer that sees a particle going by at 0.999% the speed of light will naturally say that, that they would say it has more energy than someone seeing it going by more slowly than that. So we don't necessarily need to require this to always match, but we again want to have some identifier that tells us specifically how much of some physical innate quantity that particle has. And that's where this comes in here. So we're going to look at a situation where it's going to be really similar to how we set up our um, space-time coordinates. Now, if you remember, we had, uh, sorry, our space-time separation. We had um, our space-time vector, uh, and I'll just call it x, y, z, and uh, c, t. And we took the Minkowski matrix there, which we we're calling eta, I suppose. And same thing, x, y, z, and c, t. That gave us out some invariant quantity. And so using this basic uh, prescription, let's see if maybe we can combine momentum and, and energy, relativistic energy, into some form that will give us out some other invariant quantity. And here's how we do it. We're going to take uh, the following, and we're going to treat this as the momentum four vector. So we're going to say the momentum four vector is given by P mu. Now again, we're, that's, that means a column vector equals, uh, let me write it like this, Px, Py, Pz, and uh, E. So there's not really a good reason for doing this, except for the fact that it seems to work out, and it's kind of the same way. We have spatial and time component. We have kind of spatial, including mass, and there is it's somewhat complicated, but turns out that energy has the same relation to momentum as time does to space, mathematically speaking. So you can at least take it from someone who has seen this at a higher level that yes, that's true, and someday you'll see why that's, why that's true. Um, we call it conjugate variables specifically. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna try to take the same thing, run it through the same operation here. We're gonna take that, hit the Minkowski operator with it, and then take the transform or the, or the um, transpose version of it and see what we get out. And do you see why this entire last hour was necessary for us to now begin doing this? We're using that exact same formalism to do this. And the result that we'll get out will be the last thing that we'll uh, write here. Okay, so let's go ahead and try that and let's just be entirely clear. I'll write it out very directly. We're going to take Px, Py, Pz, E. So that's how we can kind of symbolize that. And now I'm going to say that's equal to px squared plus py squared plus pz squared minus e squared. So again, I haven't really given a, a good foundational reason for throwing e in there other than saying the fact that it works. But when we do that, we now end up with some quantity that says that the momentum or the spatial portion of it, you can think of it kind of like the space-time invariance, the spatial portion of it minus the temporal portion, if you will, will be an invariant quantity. 
And the way I'm going to write this here is E0 squared. So I'm going to write E0 squared equals P squared minus E squared. And to make it work out, I'm, yeah. I was gonna add in a factor of C. Yeah, I am going to. So again, I, I always like working in, in terms where the C is equal to one, but we'll write it like that, minus E squared. So whatever that thing is there, E naught squared, Turns out it will, in fact, be an invariant quantity. And even though each individual reference frame will calculate a different value of momentum, you know, the, the faster you're going relative to the particle, the more momentum you'll see. However, each individual reference frame will also say it has a higher amount of energy. So the, 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 the faster you perceive that part, particle going, it will have both more energy, sorry, more momentum and more energy. And so that's why these two things, it, it kind of makes sense that they will actually end up canceling out. But the good, the good news is that no reference frame will ever see these to be equal to zero, the, the, the difference to, to be equal to zero. And turns out, not only that, so, so that can never quite equal that. And not only will, will, that, be, will that be true, uh, by the way, um, there's actually a minus sign here that... Um, we just kind of ignore the minus in a certain case. Anyway, don't worry about that. But uh, the important thing is that this difference here will be the same in all frames. And so this is now the quantity that when you add mass into the mix, um, for, for a simply space-time event separated by a certain amount of space, there's no mass involved. Once you throw mass into the mix, now you have to deal with it in terms of energy. And this is the invariant quantity that everyone will refer to that particle with because it doesn't matter how fast they're moving, everyone agrees it has some invariant quantity associated with it. Uh, and I'm very, I'm very, in, uh, uh, very advertently stepping around the, the, the term that we use for it, but I think maybe you, you understand what we're getting at here. So I'm going to stop there.